All right, let's pray. God, we just take this next few minutes and we say these minutes belong to you. I ask you that you would speak to every single one of us, that your word would go forth and not return void. Because the word is real, it's living, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces every piece of darkness that tries to surround us and it brings your light into the situation. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy that we're alive today. We're so grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, before you're seated, just give somebody a high five real quick and say you're looking good this morning. You're looking good. You're looking good. So glad you're here this morning. I want to say real quick uh, a special thank you to Pastor Keith, Pastor Sheila, and Pastor Josh for allowing me the privilege and the honor to speak this week. I, I, sh I, I was telling Pastor Josh, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful to be in this house called Elevate Life Church. You know, five years ago, our family moved from Oklahoma, uh, thank God, uh, to Frisco, Texas. And God brought us this beautiful family called the Kraft Family that we have the privilege to serve and be on staff and to serve you, your family, your children, and we are so honored. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm totally grateful. In five years, our life, the Baker family, myself, my name is Jeremy, my wife Carissa, has just gone straight up. It's all about alignment. Who you hang out with is who you'll become like. And I'm grateful that I get to run with champions in this house, people that are about God, people that are about putting others first, serving their community, serving the world, and I'm so grateful. I mean that. Like, I, I don't want to get all, I'm, sometimes I get emotional, so I'm not going to get emotional right now on you. Um, I'm going to hold it together, but I, I'm just telling you, I'm grateful. And when you have a spirit of gratitude, guess what God does? He just brings more your way. When you're grateful, he'll bring more your way. Well, I'm going to do my best. I'm not Pastor Keith. I'm not Pastor Sheila or Pastor Josh. Um, they call me the round mound or rebound. They call me many different things. Um, uh, but I'm going to do my best this morning. And I, for the next few minutes, I'm going to open up God's word. And I pray that we would have a heart to receive it. Here's the big thought of the message, okay? The big thought of the message this morning is this. We only see what we want to see, and we only hear what we want to hear. Our belief systems are like a big thought. It's like a mirror that shows us what we believe. Now, I know that sounds deep. I'm not a deep speaker. Uh, I'm very just kind of average, plain, like simple. But the thought process behind the big thought is this. What you see in life according to the leadershipology that Pastor Keith wrote, is what you get. What we see defines the life that we live. How many want to live a good life? Let me just see your hand. How many want to live a life that's not just an average life? Amen? We want to live a good life. So we have to see life a little bit differently. Uh, I remember when my son, Caden, I have two boys. I have a 16-year-old son and an 11-year-old son. Josiah's my first and Caden's my second. But when Caden was about three years old, we used to do the hide-and-go-seek thing. You know, every father played hide-and-go-seek, and it's funny. And then, you know, it turns into horseplay. Then it turns into wrestling. Then it turns into something broken in the house, and now you're in trouble with your wife. So it's just, it's a whole process, so it's fun. But here's the deal. I, I, I was playing hide-and-go-seek when he was about three years old, and one of his favorite spots to hide wasn't underneath the cabinets, wasn't in the closet. It was behind the curtains. Uh, some people call them drapes, curtains, drapes, whatever you want to call it. He would hide behind them, and, uh, and, and, he, would, and he would hide there. And I would count, hey, I'm going to get you, and I would know where he was at because he's three, and he can't stand still, and he would go back and forth, and the curtain is just moving, you know, and it's just swaying. And all of a sudden, you see his little feet, you know, size four, you know, kid size, uh, hanging out. And all of a sudden, I remember we were doing this, and I was going to go hide on him as he was hiding from me. But in about... Five minutes into this, he started screaming my name, yelling and crying. He had twisted himself up so tight in the curtain that he could not find the way out. And he was screaming, Dad, I cannot see, I cannot see. Sometimes that's how life is. We get so twisted up in whatever we're going through, and we don't have the right perspective of the God that we serve. And I think we miss it sometimes because it's like what we're going through is nothing compared to the God that we serve. But yet we make it so much about what we're going through and not who we're looking to. And we're all twisted up like in the curtain. And we're looking for the way out instead of just saying, God, help me. Let me pause for a moment and ask you to help me. You know, the Bible says 
in Psalms 119, in the message version, it says, verse 18, 119, uh, Psalms 119, verse 18, it says, open my eyes so I can see what you're showing me of your miracle wonder. You know, this is a year of supernatural, that God's going to do his super in our natural. This is a miracle month. This is, this is, pastor's been in a miracle series. This is what we're praying for. We're praying for those prodigal sons and daughters to come home. We're praying for those jobs to come to pass. We're praying for those, uh, those applications in college to be accepted. Come on. If you graduated from high school, you're believing God that they're going to accept you. We're believing God that the best days of our life are still before us. But somehow in this life that's like a circus, that's like a minefield, that's like a roller coaster, somehow in this life we can become so twisted up and messed up in what we're going through, we forget the promises that God has for us. It's how we see things. The title of the message is, Do You See Anything? I, it reminds me of the story I just read recently. A woman in Ontario, Canada, her name was Rose Crawford. She's been blind for 50 years, but she had surgery to restore her sight. The amazing thing about this story, though, is however, 20 years of her blindness was unnecessary. She didn't know that there was a surgical technique that had been developed, and she could have been seeing since the age of 30. She assumed that her situation was helpless and hopeless, and she dealt with her blindness. No one had told her the advances in eye surgery. Only if someone had did this. Years of her life, she said, had been wasted. It's so easy to become content in our blindness. It's so easy to become content in where we're at because we lose sight of who Jesus is. So I want to cause you to think a little bit bigger this morning. See things a little bit differently. Sometimes we only have enough faith to see God like he is. Not like he really is. Sometimes we only see what we want to see. What we see defines the life that we live, good or bad. Oh, I don't really see me and my wife making it. Oh, I, I don't really see our kids living for God. No, I don't really see that job coming to play. No, I, I've been told my whole life that I'm a nobody. I'm, I'm a nothing. I'm never going to mount anything. And look, what the li- look at the life I have. I just better be grateful for the life that I have right now because everybody's told me that I was nothing or no good. And whatever you're believing of people is kind of how we see life. But see, there's a different perspective, a different lens that we need to start looking through. You, you can stay here and have the life that you want to live or, or you can just... Believe God a little bit bigger. You know, I'm, I don't know about you, but maybe, maybe God can. Maybe God one day will. May, 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 maybe I can see that promotion will happen. But here, here's the deal. Even, even that point right there is still not where we need to be. It's not if God will. It's not if God can. It's not wonder if he'll ever do it. Maybe. I thank God we don't serve a maybe God. Thank God we don't serve a, I hope he can do it, God. Well, I hope he can raise again on the third day. I hope we can celebrate Easter because the grave is empty. I hope he died on the cross for our sins so that we could have life and experience a place called heaven for eternity. No, that that, that doesn't make no sense to me. we got to have enough faith on the inside when we start believing that, you know what? Let me just go ahead and, let me just go ahead and start, let, 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 let me go ahead and start believing God. Hold on. Hold on, hold on. Oh, oh hold on. I, I got to see. Right there they are in the front row. Oh, yeah. God, God's doing something amazing. But you got you to gotta have a belief system about you. Here's the deal. The level of our belief determines the level of the miracle we have. And if we can't believe God, he's going to do something big, then God's never going to do anything big because it's not that God's not a big God. It's based on what we believe. If I don't have an expectation that God's going to show up in my life, then he's never going to show up. So what am I doing? Spiritually speaking, i got to start walking around and have a belief system about myself. Oh, it looks like you're going through a tough situation. Yeah, it looks like that, but let me just tell you what I see on the other side of that tough situation. Oh, it looks like, 
Things ain't working out the way you want them to work out. Well, according to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, my God works all things out according to his purpose and his plan. Oh, it looks like you ain't going to be able to pay the rent this month. Oh, hold on just a second. The Bible says that God supplies all my needs according to, my, according to his riches and glory. It looks like you've been, re, you've been given a bad report by the doctors. Well, the Bible says by his stripes I'm healed. Exodus chapter 20, he's the God that healeth me. The Bible says that he took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses so I could walk in freedom, not in sickness nor disease. So let me just go ahead. A thousand may fall at my right hand, 10,000 at my left, but none will come near me. Why? Because I have a different perspective. I'm trusting in God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. But the problem is you can have a little bit of faith and just try to believe God or you can just have a belief system on the inside that I'm going to trust God no matter what. I see what God wants me to see. Those things are heavy. Okay. Here, here's the situation. According to the book, um, You Can't Buy My Love, listen to this. According to the book, You Can't Buy My Love, advertisements have changed the way we feel in love today. We are exposed to 3,000 ads every single day. From Instagram to Facebook to, to TV to the radio to podcasts to emails to the internet, we are exposed to 3,000 ads every single day. By the end of your life, you will have watched over three years of advertisements. And they say that advertisements, they have a big part of the way we see life. I'm just going to tell you something. What you see and what you're spending time watching plays what you believe in. And so that's why we got to spend time in God's word. We got to be around people that believe in us. We got to be around brothers and sisters that love God. And we got to be encouraged. We got to be motivated. Because a lot of times, we don't, listen, a lot of times we'll just settle. It's like, ladies and gentlemen, I have two pairs of shoes here. Both of them are the same shoe. This is an Air Jordan number 33. And this is an Air Jordan number 33. This shoe right here and this shoe right here are both the same shoe. But one's real and one's fake. Sometimes we settle for the fake stuff of life when God's saying, hey, I want to give you the real deal. You ain't got to be broke, sick, and broke down. You can have an abundant life. But why do we settle then? Because we see what we want to see. This one right here is not the real shoe. This is the real shoe. This is the fake, but this is the real. When these first dropped, I'll tell you a real story. Last year, I wanted the real ones, but I couldn't get the real ones, so I settled for the fake ones. I wonder how many times do we settle in life for God's okay rather than God's awesome. Pastor, Pastor Keith put up a leadership ology yesterday. It's the Kraft family motto, don't let the good be robber of the best. We settle for good when God wants the best. It might look like the same shoe. The boxes are a little bit different. The real one comes in a larger box. The fake one comes in a smaller box. The material is made a little bit differently. This is not as high quality as this. You can tell by some of the stitching on this shoe that this shoe is not going to last forever. You wear this a couple times on the basketball court. You're going you're gonna to notice that this heel is probably going to come unglued because of the resources that you, they use. And this is, what we, this is what we settle for sometimes. We settle for God's, we settle for our, our good and not God's best. God wants us to have what our desires is in our heart. God wants you to live a good life. He wants you to be blessed. The Bible says you're blessed going in and you're blessed coming out. The Bible says that Christ is within me. He's beside me. He's beneath me. He's above me. Christ is around me. Christ was, is, is within me. So, so why do I settle then? Why do I settle for thinking wrong? That's why I love our motto kind of of our church. I, I don't know if you can call it a motto, but when you elevate your thinking, you elevate your life. That's why we got to think differently. God, I'm not thinking like I used to. I thank God I'm not thinking like I used to. Because back in the day, I used to thought I'm a little punk kid from Detroit, Michigan, whose dad's in prison, who's never going to mount anything. But thank God. Thank God that I'm not thinking that way anymore. I got my own family. I got my own house. I got my own car. I got my own shoes. But you know, you can get stuck because you only see it the one way. 
Well, my dad was in prison. His dad was in prison. All my uncles and cousins, they've been locked up, divorced, messed up, drug addiction, alcoholism. So that's what your life is going to be. Until you get a hold of God's word and he starts opening this thing up and you can start seeing, hey, no. The Bible says that I'm blessed. That God's hand's on my life. That the grace and mercy of God walks with me daily. That I have the favor of God on my life. There's nothing I can't do. Here's a story real quick. Let's go to Mark chapter 8. I'm going to get out of your hair this morning. Mark chapter 8. It's a story about a man who Jesus was healing. Mark chapter 8. It's pretty powerful. And it says this in Mark chapter 8, verse 22. Then when Jesus had arrived at Bethsaida, some of the people brought a blind man to him, begging him to touch him. Hold on just a second. Some people brought a blind man to him. I'm so grateful I'm so grateful that we got friends in our life that will bring us closer to Jesus rather than farther from Jesus. We can miss that real quick. They brought him to Jesus. We can miss that. Listen, the people that you run with are so important. I, I, sometimes on young adults, I, I'll see people in young adults. You know, we, we have young adults on Tuesday nights at 730 from 18 to 30. And sometimes there's some single people up there and they're hoping, scoping, believing God, hoping to get chose, whatever you want to say. And they're looking around like, oh, yeah, she looks good. Oh, he looks hot. But what, here's the deal. It's fine, but watch. What happens is I watch very closely and intently who likes who. And all of a sudden you can sign and see the conversation. They start talking and giggling, and there's all the little butterflies like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, okay, this is about to go somewhere. Keep an eye out, okay. And so I'm like looking, and I'm like looking and watching. Matter of fact, me and my wife this week, we just celebrate 20 years of being married. And so I'm, I'm very happy for that. And I'm, I praise God, you know, I praise God she stuck it out, and uh, so it's been amazing. And so, amazing for me, but here's the deal. Uh, but but I watch it, and what happens is sometimes when people get in a dating relationship, what happens is they immediately, when they start liking each other, they immediately leave church. They stop going passionately after God. And it's crazy to me. It's like, no, stay in the game, stay in church, let Jesus be number one, because that person, you don't know if you really like that person just yet. They, they might not be the person that you think they are. Oh, it can look good on the outside, but you better look at their Facebook, make sure it's their real Facebook, ask them what their, uh, oh, okay, is that your real Facebook or is that your fake Facebook? Is that, your, do you live at home? Do you have a job? Do you have your own car? Do you pay your own cell phone? Does your parents pay your phone bill? What's your credit score? Okay, never mind, I'm not going to go there. Okay. And then you wonder why people get all, anyways. I got to stay focused on the message, folks. Don't stay with me. Then what happens is they leave the church and then they come back. And it's like, what happened? Oh, so-and-so, so it didn't work out. Boom, boom. Why'd you go? Oh, I don't know. We wanted to do our thing. No, I'm just telling you something. I'm grateful for people that bring you to Jesus. Be around people that are more passionate about God than you are. And guess what? You'll stay in the fire and you'll stay hot with him. All right, watch this. They brought him to Jesus. Real quick, I'm going to go real fast. They brought him to Jesus and Jesus... They begged him to heal him. So Jesus led the man outside of the city. Why did Jesus lead the man outside of the city? Because you have to do some history here. The history is this. The city was a bunch of people that were skeptics about Jesus. They were a bunch of people that didn't believe that Jesus was the son of God. So they led the man outside. Jesus led the man outside the city. And then all of a sudden, Jesus did something that was crazy. He spit in his hand and he put it on the man's eyes. And then he asked the man, what do you see? And this is what the man's response said. He said, I see people, they look like trees, walking trees. His vision was a little blurry. He still wasn't seeing what God wanted him to see. See, it wasn't that Jesus couldn't heal him instantly. It was the man's belief that he didn't know if Jesus could heal him. See, God can do anything, but it's up to us to believe that he can do anything. See, I've seen God do miracles in my life, so I believe that God's a miracle-working God. I've seen God meet financial needs that we've had, and he showed up every single time, right on time. I've seen God heal, and God's done some miraculous healings in our family. So I believe that God can do it. So immediately, the Bible says that Jesus laid his hands on him a second time. This is the only, now I'm not a Bible scholar, I'm not a theologian, this is the only time I can find this. Now I know we got the doctor here, we got Pastor Josh here, but here's what I'm saying. It's the only time I see it in the gospel where Jesus had his lay his hands on a man twice. Every other time it was instantly healed. Instantly. The man that was lame, remember in Mark chapter 2, the paralytic, immediately Jesus said, pick up your mat and leave, he left. Remember what Jesus said to the man at the pool of Bethesda? Hey, 
pick up your mat and go. Immediately, miracle, 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 miracle. This was the only time that Jesus had to lay his hands on the man twice. I'm thank God for that twice. You know why? Because some of us needs, needs another dose of him. Some of us need the twice. If it wasn't for the twice, we wouldn't be here this morning. So thank God for the twice. And immediately he laid his hands on him. And watch this. His eyesight was completely restored. Completely restored. Do you see anything? The question is this morning, do you see anything? Here's a thought for you. I read this in Forbes magazine. A Swiss a physicist uh, was asked by his colleague uh, at dinner, how can, how, how can it be that a bumblebee can fly? They are much larger than their wingspan, completely different than, the, than, the, than a bird. The bird's wingspan is much long, larger than the bird's body, but the bumblebee's body is much larger than the wingspan. The physicist goes on and says he did some calculations on a piece of napkin and he wrote down an equation. He goes, it's absolutely right that the bumblebee should not be able to fly according to the aviation laws. But then Dr. Jack Frazier, who is a, who is a professor at the University of Oxford, he said this. This is what he said. He said, all known laws, there is no way the bumblebee should be able to fly. Its wings are too small. Its body is too fat to get off the ground. But the bee, of course, flies anyways because the bee doesn't care what humans think about it. Now, now here's, what I'm, here's, here's what I'm trying to say to you. Some of us have bought into the lie of what people said about us. And that's why we're only seeing with these binoculars. Because we bought into the lie. Because maybe someone told you when you were a little kid that you would never mount to nothing. Maybe someone told you you would never graduate high school or go to college. Maybe someone told you that you would never be successful in life. Maybe someone told you that you can never have a good marriage. Here's the deal. We start buying into that, and that's what we believe. But again... God says in Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, with man it's impossible, but all things are possible with God. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, don't, don't let us grow weary in doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not faint. So many times we just give up. I close with this this morning. Two last thoughts with you. There was a man that bought an ocean liner ticket, and this was back in the 30s, and he was coming, he was crossing the Atlantic, and and as he was crossing the Atlantic, he, he, he didn't know on his ticket that he had access to the ship. So every day he would walk past this dining area where they would eat really nice meals, gourmet meals. And, and there would be all kinds of beautiful food laid out. And he would, just, he would just be savoring some of that food. But every night he would go back to his cabin and he would eat cheese and crackers. He was a 14-day trip, and finally on day 13, he started looking at his ticket. And it said on the very bottom of the ticket in fine print, all meals included. So many times we don't read the fine print and we miss out on the things that God wants for us. The man could have been eating the meal the whole time, but yet he didn't read the instructions. How many times do we miss the instructions when God says, just trust me, everything's going to be okay. But we start putting pen to paper and we try to figure it out on our own ability and we start panicking. How many times do we just need to go ahead and say, you know what, the Bible says trust in the Lord with all of my heart. Lean not onto my own understanding, but in all my ways acknowledge him, and he will direct my path. I've got a balance beam here, and this could be very dangerous this afternoon. If you feel like there's an earthquake, ladies and gentlemen, it's not. It's me falling, so just God bless you all. Thank you for laughing. Okay. <laughs> um, this is cedar, by the way, not oak. And so we'll just see if this 4x4 four four can hold. Um, I'm 270, okay, 285 pounds, and so I got God's word in one hand and the mic in the other. I'm preaching on Sunday morning, so you got to tell the truth, you know. If, okay. According to Google, there's five things that we got to do in order to walk on a balance beam. Now, this is according to Google. I'm not a gymnast, as you can tell. Uh, <laughs> If I was, it would be a miracle and y'all would be shouting for me, okay? So you would come to see it. Um, but according to Google, there's five things we must do to be able to walk on a balance beam. Now I'm going to tie this in with the message. In order for us to have a balanced life in the proper eyesight, there's five things we must do. Number one, according to Google, it says, have someone help you on the balance beam. I'm going to ask one of my best friends, Pastor Josh Kraft, to come up here and help a brother out. If you will, come on, put your hands together for Pastor Josh. Now, me and Pastor Josh have a, a lot of time together, and 
And I truly love him as my brother, and I tell him that all the time. And he loves me as his adopted redhead stepchild brother. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> God bless you, man. Thank you. So, number one, it says, have someone help you. You know, life is difficult already. That's why we got to have the right alignments in life. That's why we got to have the right people to help us see good. See, a lot of times we only see what we see, but with somebody else's perspective, they can see where our life can go as long as they're living for him. So it says, have someone help you. So he's going to help me. Before I start putting everything on the balance beam, I'm going to get to point number two. So at least we get two points in case something happens. (laughs) Point number two says, put one foot in front of the other. Obvious. Thank you, Google. (laughs) Point number three, because I'm going to have to do this quickly. Point number three says, don't look down. (laughs) Sometimes I think we look everywhere else except for looking. We look everywhere else except for looking up. And God wants us to look up. Five simple words I try to live by. Don't give up. Look up. Especially when it's tough. A lot of times it's easy to quit and give up, throw the towel and walk away and say, I'm not going to do it. But there's something about faithfulness. There's something about doing your best. And God will meet you there. Point number three, it says, look straight ahead. Keep focus. I got my eyes fixed on Christ. Oh, that's four. Is that four? I don't know. I'm, it's a little too high for my altitude. Number four, I think this is number four. It says, keep something in your hand to help you keep your balance. No, it's all good, man. Yeah, trying to help a brother out. I appreciate it. Keep something in your hand to help keep balance. The only thing I can think about keeping your hand to keep your balance is the word of God. It will keep a balanced and healthy life. And the last one, let's just see what this cedar four by four has got real quick. It's all good, folks. I'm, I'm going to make it. The last one says, start low, then go high. As we put one foot in front of the other, look ahead, have the word to help balance our life, and we start low, stay humble, God's going to see us through. God's going to see us through. But, we, but, but here's the deal. We, we can't be filled with our own way of doing things. we got to trust him. He's the one that makes the way where there is no way. He's the one that opens up doors that can't be opened. But here's the deal. If I try to do it my own ability, my own strength, great will be my fall. Because when there's a lot of pride comes a lot of destruction. But when you humble yourself and say, God, I I don't know how to do this deal, man. Pastor Josh shared this. I got it, folks. I'm good. I know some of you are praying in the spirit right there, but I made it. Okay, God bless y'all. You're like, Lord, let, don't, don't let that big man hit the ground, please, God. We've got to keep the screens up. I know, folks, I know. But Pastor Josh shared this last week. Uh, thank you, Pastor Josh. Pastor Josh shared this last week at our men's warrior night, and uh, he brought up to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 when... Uh, King Jehoshaphat was given some bad news. Tying my last point with this. It said in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3, it said that King Jehoshaphat feared, but then the second part of that verse said, he, but he set himself to seek the Lord. It's a human nature sometimes to have fear grip us, but it's what we do after that spirit of fear hits us that matters most. It's what we do in the moments of crisis. Fear can grip us because it's an emotion. It's it's a natural emotion of a human being. But then what do we do? I love what King Jehoshaphat did. He said, but then I set myself to seek God. Life is like a balance beam. Sometimes it's very difficult. Sometimes it feels like we're just walking on a beam that's only four inches wide. And we're surrounded by trauma and tragedy and trials and storms. But when we got the right friends that can help us up, when we 
put one foot in front of the other when we don't get dismayed and start looking down and start looking around. No, number four, but we keep our eyes focused and we put the word of God to help balance us out. And then the last one is we stay humble and ask God for his help. We make it every single time. This is a very special weekend. Me and my family are truly honored to be a part of this church and a part of your family of choice. Uh, last week I had jury duty. And uh, I know it's a great privilege, privilege to do that, but I didn't want to do it. I had no desire to go and sit in a courtroom and had a lot of other things. That, and I get it. It's a great honor. And again, hear me. I get it. Anybody ever been there? You didn't want to do it. Okay. None of you. God bless you guys. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, had to, I went in and I'm saying, surely they're not going to pick me. Surely they're not going to pick me. I, I'm a pastor. You know, I, I got some tattoos. You know what I'm saying? I got, you know, I'm not, they're not going to pick me. And, uh go around the room, hey, what do you do? I'm a pastor for youth and young adults. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, we want you. I was like, oh my goodness. So, I was like, okay, y'all want. So I'm sitting there and it's like an hour and a half into this thing, hour into this thing, and I'm thinking, Lord, help me. Let me keep my heart right in this deal. Give me wisdom here. I've never been in jury duty. Um, I've traveled for a living, so I never had to go. And so it's always, that was a blessing part of that. Now, I know it's a great honor to do that. I understand, I understand. And so they came back, the attorneys, the lawyers and all that, and then finally the bailiff came in and he goes, hey, I'm so sorry guys, but we're gonna have to let you guys go. Some of the key witnesses did not show up today and we don't have enough evidence to do this case. And immediately I got up and left. And I was thinking, wow, there wasn't enough evidence to do the case. Some of the witnesses didn't show up. And immediately when I was leaving, I felt like God spoke to my heart. Like, Jeremy, no matter what you go through, as long as you put me first, as long as you trust me, there ain't going to be enough evidence to pull you down. Because my grace and my mercy is sufficient. As long as you repent and you humble yourself and you ask God to help you, there ain't going to be enough evidence to hold you in your mess of whatever you're going through. I'm not up here proclaiming I'm a perfect man. I'm a fallen man saved by the grace and mercy of God. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a miracle that I'm on this stage and I get to present the gospel and I'm thankful for our pastors that believe, that believe in me and that believe in the next generation. But my dad was locked up. My dad was in prison. My dad was a drug dealer. He was in a gang. My life should not be like this was told as a young age, you're never going to graduate from high school, you got a learning disability, you got dyslexia, you never can make it, you're not going, you're not going to ever have a professional career, you're never going to mount anything, you're just, you, you, good luck. But you know what? On this journey with Christ for 34 years, for 34 years I've been living for Him. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but here's what I've been doing. God, I ain't got it all together, but I just need you. I need you to help me, God. I want to graduate from high school. Matter of fact, I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school. God, I want to go to college. I was the first person in my family to get a college scholarship to play ball at a college. God, I want to do something great with my life. God, I want to have a good marriage. I want to have good family. I want to be in ministry. I want to serve you. And guess what? Just going after God. Just got the right focus. I'm looking through the right binoculars. When life is tough, guess what? We don't give up, throw the towel in, or walk away. But we stand and we stand strong. Finally, what does it say? Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29, he gives strength to those that are weak. He'll strengthen us. I close in just a word of prayer. Every single person in this room, if you feel like you're stuck, you're not stuck, you just stopped. You're not stuck, you've just stopped. My brother was a missionary for seven years in the country of Haiti. I drove a six by six in the country of Haiti outside of uh, Port-au-Prince, hour and a half outside of Port-au-Prince towards the Dominican side. We had a mission base and we did missionary work for seven years. I spent, I've been to Haiti about 34 34 times, been back and forth to Haiti. Uh, It's it's a French, it's French Creole. They speak a a, a French dialect and uh, it, it is Creole and I have a heart for the Haitian people. Here's the deal. 
would go there and this one particular time I had a group of missionaries that we were hosting uh, uh, short term missionaries and I was hosting and we had this 6x6 six six. it's a military truck it's a two and a half pound truck and uh, it can pull out anything and six wheels uh, three wheels on each side kind of like what you saw last week if you were in service on stage but it was a newer version it was like an 82 GMC and I had this 6x6 six six, and I'm carrying these missionaries and we're going in these back woods in this back area and all of a sudden there's a rain had come in and torrential rain had come in and all of a sudden I'm driving this big old you know Rambo truck man I'm driving it got the missionaries and then the back and they're holding on they're like what did we sign up for we're gonna go feed some poor people and all of a sudden I got the truck and it went down in this this ravine and it got stuck and so immediately I'm trying to get it out I spent about 45 minutes trying to get this truck out I get on the satellite phone I call my father who's it back at the base I said dad I got the truck stuck man I'm sorry I don't know what to do he said son it's a six by six you can't get it stuck I said, I got it stuck. <laughs> he said, you can't get it stuck. So, you know, when you're in a third world country, it's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere as of right now. It's a little intense, and he got a little bit passionate on the phone. I said, Dad, I got it stuck. Now, my dad's old school. He was locked up. He was in prison, but thank God for his grace and mercy. But my dad, he, he still kind of sometimes goes back in the thing, back, back that way. He says some words on the phone that we can't repeat in the house of God. And he told me what to do. I had the thing in four wheel drive because it's always in four wheel drive. I didn't have it in the six low. So I got on the floor, I put it in six low. Next thing I know, pushed on the gas, boom, the truck came right out. Here's what I'm trying to tell you. You're not stuck. You've just stopped. You're not in the right gear. You're not in the right gear. You just got to go ahead and put the low and go ahead and get about. Instead, we, we try to tell everybody we stuck. We're not stuck. Thank you. Let's pray. You may be seated just for a second. I want to give everybody an opportunity. With every head bowed, every eye closed, with no one looking around, if you're in this place this morning you feel like you're stuck, you feel like things ain't working out the way they need to work out, or you can't see, maybe you got blurry vision, maybe you need another touch from heaven, maybe you need God to show up on your behalf right now. If that's you, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Christ. I'm going to count the three, and if you want to give your heart to Jesus, you want to ask Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life and come into your heart and to forgive you of your sins so that one day you'll spend eternity in a place called heaven, I want to give you that opportunity right now. Please, just for a second, don't move. This is a very special moment right now. People are about to make a decision to serve God. If that's you, when I get to three, all you got to do is simply raise up your hand, and I'm going to count you in this prayer. Here we go on the count of three. If that's you, maybe you're feeling stuck right now, and you need God's grace and God's love to pull you out. If that's you, on the count of three, lift up your hand. Here we go. One, two, three. Sip it up high all over this room. Don't be ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Now, as you sift up your hand, what I'd like you to do is just take the next step. Just stand up right at your seat. Stand up so I can see who you are. Just stand up. This is between you and God. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. No one's looking around. This is between you and God today. There's a lot of people standing today that are believing God for His grace and mercy so that everybody can come in agreement with these people that are standing. Let's all say this together. This is the prayer that I was talking about. Everybody say this with me. Everybody say, Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross and you rose again for me so that I could have life. Thank you right now for your grace and your mercy, and your love. I'm not stuck anymore because you pulled me out. I believe that in Jesus' name. Amen.